Hello everyone and welcome back. Today we continue with differential cryptanalysis of present. So, so far we discussed differential distinguishers. We talk about differential cryptanalysis. And as a homework, we experimentally verified a four round uh, differential distinguisher for the present cipher. And if you already done the homework, uh, you might have seen that it, it is not as easy as, as it looks because in practice, uh, we encounter many different problems that we weren't anticipating before uh, performing this uh, experiment. So in theory, uh, differential cryptanalysis looks really easy. Uh, with the uh, DICE example I have given you, it looks really easy. But in practice, uh, when you uh, get your hands dirty, you realize that um, many things can go wrong. So it is even worse when we are doing the key recovery attack. So today's topic will be actually the key recovery attack. And as a third homework, I will give you an uh, exercise where you will try to capture some secret key bits of the present cipher, but on a toy scale, because uh, as we are going to see now, uh, there's a 16 round differential attack on present. This is a paper uh, from 2008, I guess. It is really old, but... Uh, as you're, we are going to see, uh, we cannot perform this attack in practice because the time complexity will be really huge. So let's see how it, uh, what it is, and uh, then we will make a toy version of it to uh, really perform the homework. So let's start. So in literature, there is a 16 round uh, attack on present, but this attack type is differential cryptanalysis attack. So in this attack, Wang uses 14 round characteristics, a differential uh, distinguisher, uh, and it is given like this. So I shortened this as delta one. So we have 16 S boxes. And as you can see, only the second and the 14th S box is activated. So I'm, start, I'm counting starting from zero from the right, as we already uh, done it in our figures. So these two S boxes are activated. And Wang observes that in theory, if you uh, give this input difference to a payer, after 14 rounds of present encryption, the output difference would be this. So there will be uh, only differences only on two S boxes here uh, as nine in hexadecimal notation. But of course, uh, this has some probability. And in this case, the probability is really low. It is two to the minus 62. As you can see, this number 62 is smaller than the block size 64. This is because if you exceed that number, then uh, you wouldn't be able to distinguish this characteristic from a random permutation. So this is why actually one stops here because otherwise uh, they can reduce this uh, probability further and obtain a 15 or 16 round characteristic. So you can uh, always have a longer characteristic, but the probability should be meaningful. So in this case, uh, this number should be 62, should be larger than, sorry, uh, smaller than uh, 64. So this is why one stops here. Then they do the following. They add two runs to the bottom of this 14 run characteristic. And uh, by adding this, they actually uh, look with probability one. What would happen if the output would be nine and nine here after 14 rounds of encryption? So with probability one, you just look at these bits and uh, map them to see which S boxes are going to be activated. And actually this is the output form. So with question marks, we are representing uh, output differences, which we don't know. But with zeros, we are certain that these S boxes or those four bits are not activated. So we definitely know that there, there is no difference there. So idea is as follows. So assume that you started with this input difference and assume that after 14 rounds of encryption, uh, with this probability, you observe this difference. So uh, again, in hexadecimal notation, this would be correspond to the output difference of 0, 0, 0, 0, 0009 and 0, 0, 0, 0, 0009. So by adding two runs, we mean that what would happen to this uh, output difference? So normally we would write uh, four question marks here 
and four question marks there to say that, you know, if there's a, some input difference like nine, there will be some output difference that we would not know. But if you go back to the DDT table, uh, you will realize that this least significant bits cannot have any difference when the input difference is nine. In bit notation, nine is one, zero, zero, one. So you can uh, realize it from the DDT table. So let me go back and find where the DDT is and show you why this is the case. Yes, here. So look at the input difference nine. So this row is the possible output differences. As you can see, you can observe two, four, six, eight, C, and E. So there's a, a common property between these values I have just counted because as you can see, if you look again, they are all even numbers. As you can see, two, four, six, eight, C, which you can think as 12, and E, which you can think as 14 in integer notation. So all of them are uh, even. This is why there cannot be uh, no output difference in the least significant bit. This is why in the picture we said that there might be zero or one output difference in these bits, but we definitely know that this bit difference would be zero. So if you apply the permutation layer, so this was only the S box layer, these question marks will go to other places. And when you perform uh, one more round of encryption, uh, the S box outputs will be like this. So this is why uh, I have written it in this form. So of course there will be a permutation layer again, but uh, in terms of cryptography or cryptanalysis, that permutation layer does not provide us any more security. So I stop here. So if you perform it, the question mark will be go to different places. But the, the attacking person can always reverse this permutation layer. So uh, we don't care about that part here. So this is why I have given it like this. So in the attack, the attacker's aim would be like this. So uh, as the attacker, we assume that you ha have somehow captured the input pairs, which have these differences. But you also captured output differences, which are in this form. So our aim would be to perform two rounds of decryption and see if this difference is observed. So in order for you to perform two rounds of decryption, you should know the secret key. Of course, you don't know it. Our aim is to capture it. So here we perform a decryption for every possible round keys uh, and see uh, for which round key we observe this difference more frequently. So that is the aim of the differential attack. So let me summarize it again here. Attack procedure is as follows. First, we say that the data collection part is occurred. It is like this. You gather M plain text cipher text pairs with input difference this and the output difference this after 16 rounds. Okay, so I assume that you somehow capture this many plain text and cipher text, corresponding cipher text. Then we perform the key guess part. Partially decrypt these pairs with every possible key bits of rounds 16 and 15 that correspond to S boxes with non-zero difference. Correct key should have the highest counter. So we say partial decryption because if you take two ciphertext pairs here and try to perform two rounds of the encryption, uh, remember that uh, round keys have 64 bits. So if you try to use every possible 64 bit key. For this round, it will be two to the 64 different keys. And we are uh, personal computers does not have that many computational power. You cannot perform two to the 64 uh, encryptions on a personal computer, regardless of if you are using a GPU or CPU. So this is why you need to focus on only the bits, which are actually you need to you have control over. So since there are non-zero differences here, your aim should be to guess the uh, four round key bits here, four here, 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 and so on. Only the activated S box. So once you perform the decryption, you will have these values. You perform the you know inverse permutation, and again, uh, of uh, then again try to guess the uh, key bits corresponding to these two S boxes, okay? 
So uh, I think eight bits here and 32 bits here, which would uh, means that you need to guess 40 bits of round keys corresponding to 16 and 15 round. So of course I haven't put the layers here, but there is a, a key XOR at the end here, right? You do it, perform the SBOX operation and there's a key XOR before this SBOX operation and so on. So uh, once you capture these 40 bits of the round keys, then you can capture the other ones by actually performing an exhaustive search. But now that you already captured some part of the secret key, uh, performing an exhaustive search uh, now is easier. For instance, if you are attacking present with 80-bit secret key, in a normal exhaustive search attack, you have to perform two to the 80 encryptions, but now you captured 40 bits here already. So you need to perform two to the 40 uh, encryptions for the remaining key bits. So, this actually leads us to our uh, toy version of this attack from the literature. So Wang attacks 16 rounds, but in theory, it is not uh, possible to verify this attack in practice. So I shortened this attack to seven rounds, and now we will perform the attack on the seven rounds. So idea is, idea is similar. We are going to use a five round characteristic for presence. So actually the first four rounds were the previous homework where we experimentally verified the correctness of this four round characteristic. Now we focus on five rounds of it. So the five round characteristic again from Wang's paper is as follows. If you give this input difference, which is actually activating two S boxes, zero and the third S boxes with the input difference four, uh, Wang observed that after five rounds of encryption, we should see the output difference at the two S boxes, zero and eight S boxes with nines with probability two to the minus 22. So now we again add two more runs to this uh, to this part. So again, if this is your uh, output, what happens is as follows. There is a key XOR here, but uh, since you are uh, XORing a pair with the same keys, which secret keys you don't know, uh, the nine difference does not change. But after the SPACs operation, uh, the output difference will be as follows. Again, once you apply the permutation layer, it goes here. Now there is a round key XOR here just before the S box. We perform the S box operation. I omitted the uh, permutation layer again. So there's a final uh, round key XOR here and you obtain the ciphertext. So this is going to be our aim. So I already uh, chose a secret key and I gave uh, this input difference to some plain text, and I performed seven rounds of present encryptions, and I only stored the output uh, ciphertext pairs, which has this output difference. So I gathered actually 80 of them, which will be enough for you to perform this attack. So I'm going to give you 80 plain text and ciphertext pairs, where plain text has this input difference and the corresponding ciphertext pairs has this output difference. So what you're going to do is to check which round key bits are the correct ones. So in order to do that, you need to partially decrypt two rounds back and obtain uh, and check if this uh, uh, nines are observed here with of course other S boxes being zero. So let me again summarize it as follows. Our aim is to attack seven rounds. And again, uh, recall that I'm giving you many plain text cipher text pairs, which has the input difference alpha. Again, we denoted as x0 being four, x3 being four. These are the input differences. Of course, the other S boxes does not have any, uh, do not have any input difference, so they are zero. And the output difference we denote as uh, X4 will be question mark, which can be anything. Again, uh, X6 is question mark and so on. So if you go back to picture, this corresponds to here. But of course, uh, you will need to perform round key guesses here again, because uh, let me tell you why. 
if we go from top here, as you can see, the nine would have some difference in the form of unknown value, unknown value, unknown value, and non-zero, sorry, zero difference. So this zero, if you recall the permutation layer goes here, right? And the other zeros actually are coming from here and so on. But uh, that zero will also go as output zero because if you don't give an input difference, there won't be an output difference. But in order for you to uh, go from here to here in the backwards direction, you need to know uh, what the value is here. So we know that it doesn't, so you have pairs and we know that their XOR is zero at that bit, but both of them can be zero or both of them can be one. Uh, this picture doesn't show tell you which one. So for this reason, you have to perform the decryption from here and see what that value is. This is why you need to guess the key bits correspond to it here. So again, go back, let's go back to the homework. For the sake of simplicity, we omitted the last round's permutation. Two S boxes in the sixth round and eight S boxes in the seventh round are activated. Thus we are attacking 10 times four. So 10 S boxes are activated and you know, just before the S box, there is a four bit round uh, key XOR. So we are actually trying to guess 40 bits of the round keys. So uh, what you're going to do is as follows. For every candidate 40 bit round key, initialize two to the 40 counters. We call them TI and let's initialize them to zero. Then what you do is as follows. Perform two round decryptions the encryption operation on the ciphertext that I'm going to give you, CI and CI XOR betas. But of course, these will be partial decryptions. And increase the value of the counter for the key that you are guessing when the uh, decryption value after the two runs of partial decryption. Uh, if, if you see the uh, differences nine and nine here, then you should increase the counter for that key. So after the end of the attack, uh, sort the counters and the highest uh, counter value would be the correct one, right? So if you go back to the picture, so what you're actually trying to guess keys as follows, there's a round key XOR here, 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 and so on. So there are eight S boxes here. And since there are four bit values here, you have to guess the third to do third two bit keys here. So initially, you need to perform two to the 32 decryption operations for a single ciphertext pair so that you can go from here to here, right? Then uh, there will be a, a key, round key XOR again here, but now we are only interested in these four and these four values, which actually corresponds to these six question marks and these two zeros here. So all you need to guess the round key bits correspond to this eight bits. So you need to perform two to the eight more operations. So you can actually divide your algorithm into two parts. First, you can perform a two to the 32 in decryption operations for a given pair. And if it doesn't give you this difference, then you know you don't need to continue further. So you can divide the two to the 40 encryption into two to the 32 plus two to the eight because they are two independent runs. So this is actually one way of optimization, but actually you can do even better. You know, probably you will see these optimizations by yourself because again, two to the 32 is not that hard to perform, but if your implementation is not fast, uh, you might need to wait a few hours to perform two to the 32 encryption operations, but uh, recall that I already told in my lectures, on a GPU performing two to the 32 encryption operations takes less than a second. And here you are actually performing one round of encryption. Actually, you are only performing an FU SBOX operation. So two to the 32 should not be that hard for you. Even two to the 40, you can do it with your laptops or your desktops if uh, your implementation is good, okay? So now you might think that since there's a decryption here, you might think that you need to uh, implement the decryption version of the present 
cipher. But actually, as you can see, what we are doing is just taking the inverse of this SBAX, right? So you just implement the inverse SBAX operation. And then these bits goes to those places. You don't even need to implement the inverse of the permutation layer because all you are interested in these eight bits, you already know that which one are going to which places. Then again, you will need to perform the inverse SBAX operation, right? So there is many optimizations that you can perform here. So I think I will give a hint here too. We expect the correct 40 bit round key to get the highest counter, but in practice, some round keys might not be independent from others and they might get the same counter as the correct key. Check if this is the case for this attack. Yes, this is uh, one thing I forgot to mention. Actually, I will uh, explain why this is the case in the following slides. So in a differential attack, since we are guessing 40 bits here, uh, and you know we assume that a correct key acts like the, you know, uh, the version which actually works with these probabilities. And we assume that wrong keys uh, behave like a random permutation. And we call this, this is, as a uh, wrong key randomization hypothesis. So this is why if you can keep two to the 40 counters for every possible round key that you are going to guess and perform this partial decryption operations, we expect the correct key to get the highest counter. But as we are going to see in the following slides, when you perform this attack, you will realize that some round keys will get really uh, high counters compared to others. But uh, whenever a counter for a round key increases, uh, another round key uh, has a counter of another key also increases for the cipher text pairs as if uh, some keys are related to each other, okay? So I will explain to you why this is the case, but another thing to mention here, if you try to keep two to the 40 counters in a memory, uh, you might calculate it by yourself, but two to the 40 uh, counters will be huge for your RAM to uh, store them. So you might again need an optimization here. Actually, you might uh, not keep a counter for all of the keys, but because most of the round keys would not get any hits at all, because you are going to work on 80 pairs. So most of the uh, round keys would not get a hit at all. So you might only store the round key candidates, which has uh, more than zero uh, hits, let's say. So I gave a lot of hints, but we can also discuss it later. Let's move on to Wang's attack and see why I made this remark here. Because uh, in theory, you know, uh, the theory does not match with practice in most of the time. But of, of course, in theory, theory equals to practice, but in practice, theory never uh, meets uh, is the same with the practice. So this is the main problem. When you do it, this attack on the paper, it looks like it is going to work, but in practice it does not. So this is what happened to Wang's attack actually. So recall that uh, Wang actually found 14 round differentials, which looks like the one five round characteristic that we have used. But this time the probability is lower than ours. It is two to the minus 64, but actually in the original paper, they used to went to four different characteristics with uh, same probability and uh, output difference. So this probability is actually uh, higher than two to the minus 62 so that the attack actually works better. But they claim that they captured 32 bits of the key with this many round encryptions. And then they say that remaining 48 bits uh, can be captured by performing an exhaustive search. And, you know, they, they actually thought that what the same thing with us. They thought that uh, if they guess the round keys here and here, they thought that the correct round key would get the highest counter. But uh, years later, I realized that when I perform a similar attack in practice, I realized that uh, correct key gets the highest counter 
but some wrong keys also get the same counter and I cannot distinguish which one the correct one. So I analyzed this behavior and realized that there is actually a mathematical reason behind it. So uh, this is how I actually discovered a property that I named later as differential factor. So let me explain it here. Most of the time, most of the time, attacks cannot be verified in practice due to high data time or memory complexities. Reduced versions of theoretical attacks should be experimentally verified to check if anything is overlooked. Bang's attack should be modified due to the existence of differential factors. So let me give you the definition of a differential factor. So let S be a function from F2 and to F2M. So actually I'm saying that S is an M by M uh, S box and in our example, N and M are four. So we have a four by four S box in the case of present. So just fix the output difference of your uh, S box operations and just consider all of the possible input pairs that give you this output difference. So this is actually what we done when we are calculating the DDT table. And sometimes uh, for all of these X, Y pairs that give you the output mu, sometimes there's a value lambda, which acts like as follows. For all of those X, Y pairs, XOR X with lambda and Y with lambda, and you would observe that the output mu would not change. And I, for these cases, I say that this S box S has a differential factor lambda for the output difference mu. In other words, mu remains invariant when you add the XOR inputs, if you XOR the inputs with lambda. So you might think that what is this has to do with our uh, problem. This is as follows. As you can see here, for instance, uh, assume that we are actually uh, trying performing this inverse SPAX operation. So we are looking for the uh, cases where the output difference is nine. So in our example, mu is nine. So we are focusing on all of the pairs here. So we don't need to uh, look all of the pairs, but assume that there's a pair here, X and Y, so that after this uh, inverse S box operation, we observe the value in nine and we go and increase the counter of that round key, right? But due to the existence of that lambda, for those X, Y pairs, exoring with them, exoring them with lambda would also give you nine. But exoring them with lambda actually means that since there is a round key XOR here, actually here uh, after the permutation layer, but you know you can change the places. So uh, to be actually simplify the example, when you perform this operation for a round key of four bits corresponding to these question marks and zero, if a round key value increases, since there's a lambda for this nine value mu, that round key exhort with lambda would also satisfy this property. In other words, observing nine. So the counter of that value would also increase. So whenever a key counter increases, another one also increases when there's such a lambda. And uh, by chance, uh, the S box of uh, present has differential factors, and this is not the case for every S box. Even there are some four by four S boxes which does not have, uh, which do not have differential factors. But in this case, present has differential factors, and for the inverse S box, when you fix mu equals to nine, there will be some lambda. So for this reason, uh, the correct key would always get the same counter with some of the wrong keys. So for this reason, the attack does not capture those round key bits as it is claimed, but actually it captures less of it. So for this reason, I'm saying that theory here does not match the practice because they have overlooked such a property. And the main reason behind is that this is a theoretical attack. Since nobody has that computational power, they wouldn't be able to perform the attack and check if it works in practice. But the toy versions are important for this reason. In our homework, you would observe this behavior and realize that uh, the correct key gets the highest counter, but some other wrong keys would get the same counter too. So 
this way we can uh, actually see uh, what happens in a real life crypt analysis scenario. 